Well, good morning. I'm glad uh, that I get to be your first, for most of you, session after, uh, after keynote. Welcome. I get you when you're fresh. Yeah. So if you're here for all meat, no fillers, you are in the right place. My name is Rob Ortiz. I'm actually the director of uh, artificial intelligence for Keyence. Uh, Brian Neely is missing. <laughs> He's actually downstairs, uh, so I'm going to have to sh single single show him in this one. But uh, so, real quick, a little about me: who the heck uh, I am, why I'm up here on stage. Uh, so. I actually had quite a very difference in past. I actually started an online retail company when I was 19 years old to help pay my way through college. Uh, and I ended up using a lot of that experience when I shifted over into Keyence for doing some of our analytics. Uh, I've been with Keyence now for 16 years. And uh, one of my major roles was I actually launched our deployed analytics uh, group set and team quite a few years ago, about, about nine years ago inside Keyence. Currently, I do run our artificial intelligence division. Uh, and uh, I do enjoy Tableau. I'm not nearly as good at it as I'd like to be. I'm aspiring to get in there. Uh, and I do end up doing some, uh, some sci-fi novels. They're horrible. You will never get to read them. Uh, and I do enjoy board games, and I build a lot of board games. My wife thought it was fairly entertaining that I was going to a conference where I could actually put things like that onto a slide, and at least some of the audience would have, uh, you know, feel some solidarity to me. But you didn't really come here to just hear about me. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Keyence and kind of what we're doing inside the artificial intelligence space. So Keyence, uh, real quick, I'm sorry, I like audience participation. I like to make sure that you're not all snoozing. Has anyone ever heard of Keyence? Okay, that's a lot more hands than I expected. So Keyence is not a household name. Uh, we actually were founded in 1974, and uh, as an organization, we're an automation company. So we are actually integral into most of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. We are supplying most of the equipment that goes into your autonomous vehicles uh, or that goes into any sort of robotics systems like your manufacturing environments. We do a lot of the sensors and measurement equipment that goes into those systems. Uh, we actually invented the first drone. So if you want to look it up, it's a Keyence gyroscoper. Uh, horrible name, but that was the, the first drone. Uh, that was one of our initial deployed products. And then we're heavily involved in sort of your everyday sensing tools. So be it from your microwave to the check engine light in your vehicle to the cell phone that you're currently playing Clash Royale on. I see you in the back of the room. Uh, Forbes calls us uh, one of the most 100 innovative companies. And we've done a lot of work over the last couple of years to try to maintain that forefront in the technology sector. Uh, one of the things that the Financial Times actually says that we're one of the most important companies that no one's ever heard of, which explains why there's only a few names that have actually shown up. But if you have a cell phone, you are currently holding a Keyence product in your pocket, or at least parts of it that are in there. Part of our company's culture is we try to stay five to seven years ahead of the rest of the market as far as technology goes. Uh, We've done a decent job at that. It's part of our initiative, and it's actually so well-founded into our culture that our CEO actually has littered our headquarters with fossils. So it's impossible to walk anywhere around our headquarters without physically having a visual reference to what happens if we stop evolving and innovating. Uh, this is actually a live one that's actually up there in our headquarters. So why are we here? Well, I like the, uh, there's, there's a quote from Hillary Mason that I really like. And it's that the job of the data scientist is to ask the right questions. Most of you are not data scientists. This is an entry level uh, presentation. So I actually find that this goes to the same to data analysts and business analysts as well. Asking the right questions is core and critical to any business setting. If we could only ask the perfect questions in every situation, then we'd be the infinite, most important, most powerful business people and business leaders in the world. Let me give you an example, though, of kind of what most people, myself included from, uh, from quite a while back, experience on a day-to-day -day basis when it comes to working with our C-suites or working with those who are the receivers of the analytics that we're providing to them. So this is me. And uh, here's another character that I work with a lot. His name's Terry. He's my CMO. And uh, I'll come in on a, on a Monday morning, and Terry may be standing there right there at the elevator, and 
gives me the real quick, hey Rob. He then generally follows that with the two words that are the death to my productivity. It is the sign that I'm going to accomplish nothing over the next seven days. Quick question. Shudder. I got alerted by the Tableau dashboard this morning that sales volume dropped below the threshold we'd set. Do you have time for a quick meeting that we can figure it out? And I'm, of course, accommodating to him. He signs my checks. Sir, let me go grab my laptop. As I mentioned, sales volumes are down. Do you have any ideas? Terry, this is why we have Tableau, self-service analytics. It's explorer functions. They let you dig into the data. You can solve this question yourself. This obviously goes over very well, right? <laughs> you probably get an answer a little bit like this. Yeah, but you're a lot better than this than I am. Okay, okay, where do we start? So, any ideas? Sure. My assumption, it has something to do with the new product that we had launched. Do you have that dashboard yet? No, Terry. This was what I was trying to accomplish this week before your quick question. Not yet. I can build it real quick, though. Can we end this meeting so I can go actually go accomplish something? Oh, yeah, yeah. Also, let's check deliverables. It might have been that as well. And actually, while I'm thinking about it, and while you're in there, because it's so easy for you to do all of this work, right? could you also give it to me by salesperson? I think it might be an issue in the salesperson that's causing some of these issues. Okay, I got it. I'll get on it. We go back, we work some of our magic. Hey, dashboards are done. They're up on Tableau server. Mm, this doesn't quite show me what I was looking for. Hey, could you make some modifications to this? Could you drill it down by subgroups for me? Yeah, sure, hold on. Let me get back to it. Ooh, 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 I had another thought. Can we sales, see sales by only the new salespeople? I think we might have something from the tenure side as well. I can see my to-do list just growing. Sure thing. Let me get on that one. And the time rolls on. The chuckle's in the room, right? Those of you who are new to, to doing the Tableau world, you can look to your left and right and understand that this is a, this is a common problem that we deal with, right? We're going to sit back into that conference room a couple days later, and we're going to say, hey, all right, we did all the analysis, and I'm pretty sure X is the problem. Yeah, I don't see it. I think why is a bigger issue. And then of course there's always somebody who comes in late into the conversation and says, you know what we should do? We should take a look at this from a completely different angle. Okay, well, well, now that we've got it all figured out, I'm passing it off to another department because this has gotten too large of a scope for me to end up handling with, and I've got other clients inside of our company that I need to handle, that I need to manage. So why do we get stuck into this cycle, right? As data analysts, our job is to build deliverables, right? We wanna build actionable intelligence and actionable insights that our business leaders can utilize. We, as those users, we can build this all-powerful genie Cosmic power, ooh, I like the sound of that. This can be inside of a domain expert, a, a Tableau Zen master, you can use a, an AI platform, something along those lines. It could be a really weird CGI blue guy. We can also build these beautiful lamps, right? We can build these dashboards that are just gonna make people cry, they're so gorgeous. But at the end of the day, it's the ability of the wisher that makes the biggest impact. 
they're the ones who have to ask the right questions that lead to results. This is the difference between saying, how do we stop world hunger, and how do we ensure everybody has enough to eat? If you want to say, how do we stop world hunger, well, all we need is an infinite supply of bologna sandwiches. Getting them to the right people, well, that's a different portion of the question. So let me give you a real world example. This is a dashboard that I actually use. This is a real, real one. This is looking at our different salespeople. So I've got my salespeople over here on the left and the number of customers that they've interacted with that they've made sales with on a monthly basis. I've got where those customers are located. I've got the industries that those customers are. And I've got two different product groups up here and I'm looking at the amount of repeat customers versus new customers. The orange is the repeats and the blue is the new customers. Now these are two different product groups. I only manage one of them, the one that's on the right. But they're sibling products and the exact products don't matter. But they should be very similar from a market standpoint. And I can immediately detect I've got a problem. My repeat rate on that XM product group, that product group on the right, is significantly below where it should be. The number of customers that we've gotten in this, in this period of time isn't the same demographic that it should be. Okay, dashboard has done its job. Now, what do we do? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at that data and we're gonna go and look at some of the pre-built dashboards that we've already generated that we already have saved into our server environment or that we have saved on somebody's computer. And we're gonna say, all right, let's take a look at this by region. Is it maybe a certain region that's causing an issue on that repeat rate? No, it's not the region. Okay, let's look at this by actual sales amount. Maybe it was a certain price point that we were... No, no, it's not the price point. Okay, well, what if we looked at it by industry? Is it a specific industry that's giving us a... No. No, it's not the industries. Okay, let's look at it by actual product. Which specific section of the product is it that... No, nope, there's a whole lot of different things that are happening. Okay, let's take a look and create some new ones. Let's build a new one based on salesperson. Let's build a new one based on the lifetime value of the customer. Let's build a new one based on the actual number of service calls that we've done to those customers. Let's look at the actual web activity that customers have... Whew. By the time I'm done, I've taken three to six weeks to look through all the different possibilities, done some ad hoc reporting, Met, done some strategy sessions, met, done some strategy sessions, met, done some strategy sessions, and we finally get to a solution. Had I known in the very, very beginning what that answer should have been, how does this impact that repeat ratio, I probably could have found that answer in as little as maybe 15 to 30 minutes. So when we start looking at a problem, we're dealing with all these different possible questions for how is this causing this? How is that related to that, right? How is the price impacting this? How is the customer impacting it? How is our internal groups impacting it? What you're doing here without even realizing it is a process known as feature engineering. That's a data science-y term. But feature engineering is simply the process of using your domain knowledge, so your knowledge about the company itself, to create new angles and viewpoints that will make the insights in the data appear more sharply. Congratulations, you all hit level one data science. But the problem becomes, what if we don't have that domain knowledge? As companies continue to grow and analytics teams continue to grow and analytics becomes that much more important to organizations, we don't have an infinite supply of people who are masters of the business unit. Or in some cases, we're segregated and we have our data analytics groups and we have our business units and they don't really talk too well to each other. There's communication issues that we run into. So it comes down to asking those right questions. So we ran into this problem ourselves. Key Ents as an organization, about eight years ago, we started to run into stumbling blocks when it came to communicating between our business units and our data groups and being able to figure out what was that root cause of the issue we were trying to investigate. So we sat down and we took a new approach to it. We do a lot of automation. So we said, okay, what can we do to automate that process? The first thing we had to do is we had to figure out what questions do we have to ask to figure out what questions we have to ask. There's some circular logic going on in here. A couple of people in the room are going, he's a little nuts. The first question we had to look at 
is what is the most important information to show? We have an infinite number of different angles that we could use. What is the piece of information we have to actually get to the user? The second is what can we actually change? Sure, it's nice to know that title polls have a great correlation to whether or not our customers purchase, but I don't know how to impact the moon's phases. So what can we actually impact? And then lastly, we're a company of engineers. We're really lazy. So we look at what can we get the most impact for the least amount of effort. So if we're able to filter out and say, hey, here are the different things we could impact, right? maybe we get down to five, six, eight of them. Which one of these gets us the most for the least amount of work? So once we figured that out, inside Keyens we started building. Warning, data science ahead. So what we ended up doing behind the scenes was we created a technology of automatic feature engineering and automatic feature learning. And essentially what this does is it's creating metadata out of the original data sets. It then generates a list of aggregations and common calculations that would be utilized. Those of you who have utilized Tableau are familiar with some of the aggregations and the fact you can build calculations in. We simply had the machine learning system do that process for us. Secondly, we utilized gradient-boosted decision trees in order to actually predict how the target would be impacted if we were to make changes to it based on what we could impact in the past. We also utilize this one because it's really good at dirty, dirty information. I'm not gonna do another show of hands because I know it would be everybody of who has some dirty information, some unclean data sets. Okay, that's it. I promise this was an entry-level class. We're done with the data science portion. Those of you who zoned out, Facebook, Twitter updates, come on back. So the concept is that when we look at a series of data, so here's some sales transactions. I have on here some dates and times. I have on here the customers. I've got the product categories, the quantities, the amounts. As analysts, if we wanted to figure out patterns in here, can anybody come up with one? You don't have to say it out loud, but look through there and find a pattern of some sort. Find a grouping that we can create. The first thing I might look at, because I was talking about repeat just a second ago, is a repeating customer. So here's customer 10111, and they've purchased twice. Great, I've found a pattern. Now what we can do if we want to create new data from this is to actually build it into a new table. So let's group that customer and all their interaction in as new data values. We're now gonna create new values by product group, by the quantities of purchases, by the mins, the max, the averages, the price per each purchase. So we've now created some new values that we can look at. Let's say we took a look at day of the week. Anybody notice Monday was on there twice? There's a pattern. We can now start grouping things by day of the week. So let's create a new table, look at day of the week, number of customers, number of transactions that we're getting, the total sales, the sales per customer. Let's take a look at products. We could group this together by the products. Let's look at just the sensors. So here's the number of transactions, here's the sales per units, the number of weekdays that we have sold on. Ooh, there's another pattern. We could look at weekdays versus weekends. We could look at the month. These are all happening in November. So at this point, so here's our weekends, right? Saturdays and Sundays. So at this point, we're able to create dozens of additional tables inside of the data. Now that's when we have just transactional data. But let's up the game a little bit. Let's add in some customer data. Let's also add in some web activity. And just because I'm a masochist, let's add in some sales activity too. Once we have all of that, we can now start to find patterns that exist inside all of these different tables, generating new tables for each piece of information as we go. For something that's as simple as 16 or 17 different columns, we can create 300, 400, 500,000 different new pieces of information that you can look at. This is what analysts, you guys are at this capability. That's feature engineering just looking at the data values and creating new values from it. So what we then end up doing is we take each of those values, 
So we created a new set of data for just retail customers. All right, let's see how we mix that with their purchase amounts or their purchasing salesperson, so who they purchased it from. Let's blend together customers who purchased more than a certain amount of times, a count of those customers, and what they purchased or what they've never purchased. Let's also throw in there a certain amount that they've spent. Let's create another group. Let's throw together those companies that have a size of less than a certain amount of revenue. And let's throw in those that our sales team hasn't reached out to in a certain amount of time. Once we've mixed these together, we can now look and see how much is this impacting our initial question. So if I was to impact this demographic, I'd be able to increase that repeat ratio, going back to our initial example, that repeat ratio of 5.3%. If I was able to impact this one, we'd be able to increase that repeat ratio by only 4.9. Let's not do that one. If we do it to this guy, this will increase that repeat ratio, oh, 14.7%, yeah. Yeah, I wanna do that guy. So this goes back to trying to figure out what's gonna give us the biggest impact for the least amount of effort. So in the end, what our system was that we designed for ourselves was to scan the data for the relevant information to that question. Secondly, we wanted to create new data, new aggregations, new calculations inside that data set. Combine the data together into that nearly infinite number of different configurations. And then we wanted to scan for that largest impactor and simulate the final results. Our goal was to be able to go from this mess of questions. What is the actual driving impacting factors? What do I need to look at? What is the dashboard that's going to be the ultimate decision maker, the ultimate direction for us? And just get rid of all the noise and focus on the one that we know is gonna actually work. How are customers in that $100 million revenue range without phone calls in the last 41 days doing? Answer, I already know, poorly. So let's build that dashboard so we can evaluate those customers and action that initiative. The platform we developed was called Kai. And we designed it internally to be able to solve our own internal issues. When we deployed this system, the concept was that we would grab data from various data sources. So grabbing data from just files, flat files, CSV files, Excel files sitting on the computer somewhere. Also be able to grab that from your databases. Also be able to grab that from cloud sources. From there, these are already being fed into Tableau Server, into Tableau Desktop. So once we have that, those are being fed to our users, be them ourselves, or those who are on the receiving end of our dashboards. We connected Kai to the same data sources. So it had the capability of looking at all the data, the same data that was in those dashboards. Once it analyzed what was gonna be the most impactful, we had it feed that information back into a new database. And then just to complete the circle, fed that database back into Tableau. So now we have this continual cycle that runs on a morning basis of looking at, hey, here's our dashboards, here's the things that have changed, here's what we need to focus on today in order to have the biggest impact. And each day, it's producing new dashboards of exactly the thing we have to action today. What this is designed to do and what it gave us the capability of is that we have each of our business units. But from our data science team, they're now capable of focusing on the high-level needs items. Our BI teams are able to focus on those initiatives that are cross-divisional, that are focusing on the entire organization, overall sales, overall efficiencies, things along those lines. And then we started to have these users pop up inside each of the business units. People who may not have had high-level business intelligence capabilities or may not have had any data science capabilities who now have the ability to start asking questions of how do I impact our overall business strategy. They're now able to automatically 
develop the dashboards and the action plans vertically inside their own organizations. But it also started to improve their knowledge base, their ability to talk intelligently about data, their ability to feed back to the BI teams what was impactful to their businesses. These are the five things that are the most important to us. I didn't know that a couple of months ago, but now that I've been looking at it, these are the things we need to see and we need to analyze, which then helps us make better large-scale dashboards for the entire business unit. And then, yes, we do feed some of that over the data science team if we want to do any full-end machine learning models off of those data values. So the end result is that we get to go from that first dashboard that we started with, the one that says, hey, there's a problem. Going through Kai, we're then able to generate a final action plan dashboard, saying, hey, here's what we're gonna do. We are going to try to increase the number of phone calls to those companies who have $100 million or less in total revenue that we haven't reached out to in more than 41 days. That's pretty specific. Oh, and by the way, if you did it, the ROI value is going to increase. We're going to have a repeat rate increase of 14.7%. A couple of things that we ended up finding when we developed this. So we developed the system internally, and we deployed it in 2011. And we designed it specifically for the business level user. And we wanted them to be able to ask why and allow them to prepare those shortcuts and those data that they can feed to then the BI teams of the data science. Since that time, Kansas had over 300% growth in the last eight years, but our headcount has not increased significantly. This is part of what makes us so attractive to the market, is how we were able to figure out how to make our people that much more efficient as an organization and it's data. Anybody who hasn't been a believer in evangelizing the power of data, I will happily tell you that it is the most impactful thing to our business that we've ever experienced. We're a publicly traded company, so you can take a look at our actual revenues and sales on the open market. That's where we launched Kai. That's been the result. Anybody wants a copy of that to go pass off to their C-suite, I will happily provide it. It's available on Google Finance. So let me give you another, another story for a second here of some of the use cases that Keyence has had of being able to use data effectively that we never thought we would have had. Inside Keyence, if you want a job as a salesperson, what's gonna happen is you're gonna go through a series of interviews. You're gonna go through HireVue, if anybody's ever familiar with that. It's a web-based uh, video interview process. We're also gonna get your resume. We're gonna have people review your resume. You're then gonna come in and do interviews. You're gonna have probably three interviews. You're also gonna have a sales demonstration, a technical exam, and a personality profile. If you were to max out each of those categories, so if you were to get perfect scores on your resume, Nobody had any issues with it. Your interviews went fine, you answered all the questions correctly, you did a great demo. Your technical exam, you got over a 90%, you had higher than a 70% personalities match to a sales job. You could potentially earn up to 120 points. So we have a point system to help us rank which uh, salespeople we wanna try to offer to. Well, about five years ago, we had a big project. We were looking at the retention rate of our salespeople. And we realized that it wasn't quite where we wanted to be. We were only about 3.4 years was the lifetime uh, of our salespeople. And so we took all the data, just the evaluation scores that we had given those salespeople and the sales amounts that they had contributed, and we took their surveys, uh, sorry, the uh, interview data, and we plugged it into Kai. And we said, okay, how do we improve retention? And here we were expecting it to come out with something saying, hire from this university, or look for this, job, uh, this career experience, or this, uh, degree program or things like that. The answer it gave us was never hire anybody who scores higher than 116. I'll tell you immediately, we all sat in the room and scratched our head for a little bit. Said, so wait a second. You're telling me that the way to improve is never hire good candidates? 
We started looking deeper into the data as to why the system had told us this. The end result was that those candidates were people that were getting poached, or they were individuals who were actively looking at another job. Their turnover time was actually fairly significant. So much so that the amount that we were investing into onboarding those individuals versus what they were actually bringing into us as an organization actually had them leaving in the red for the cost on our end, plus it was tearing down our overall average tenureship. So we stopped hiring those people. We actually were able to get our salesperson tenureships from that 3.4 years up to 4.6 years. So a 1.2 year change by not hiring the best candidates. How many HR administrators do you think you'd be able to say, hey, you know what I want to do? I want to analyze, take a couple of weeks and figure out, should we hire the best people? Because I don't think we should. They'd laugh you right out. So data can be used in a wide variety of different places, and it's often surprising as to where that information is going to come and where it's going to lead you to as far as value. So now, that we've deployed these systems internally, I don't really fear this question as much. I'm gonna still put that as much. There's plenty of ways people can find ways to, to soak up time. Because they're usually followed with something like, oh, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. I, I actually figured it out instead. All right. If we have somebody who says, I need to build a sales strategy, well, we're just gonna ask the system to actually build it and feed it back to them. If we see that we have a problem, some KPI has dropped outside of the threshold, okay, that's it. Let's go talk to that group. So now, I get to leave on time. Sometimes. If you're interested in actually seeing the product, so what we did is Keyence took this system and we've actually spun it out as a new product that's available to the open market. And we're actually officially launching it to the market space here at Tableau. We did a soft launch in June, the response weight was fantastic. Here at Tableau, we're officially bringing it to the market space so that you guys can use the exact same platform that we were utilizing. It is a no-code system. It is designed for someone who has no data experience, and no AI experience. If you're interested, there's, I think there might still be seats left, I can't confirm, for our hands-on session that'll be happening tomorrow. But fun anecdotal uh, response, or fun anecdotal story. I have a, uh, an eight-year-old at home. I actually have an eight, six, and four-year-old, so that's why I keep my hair short. Can't pull it out. Uh, he actually loves taking his Pokemon cards. We pulled a set of data for Pokemon cards and he drops it into the Kai AI system. And he actually feeds it decks that his friends are playing. He just writes down all the cards that they're playing, and he says, how do I beat their deck? This is my eight-year-old using artificial intelligence to try to kick his friend's butt. So it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of fun things that you can do uh, once you unlock the capabilities that are inside, asking the right questions. In that case, it may not be you need to add two of these cards. It could be you need to change the color of the deck, or it could be you need to get this card out first. So if you want, please feel free to check it out. If there's no spaces available, you can always find us down in, uh, in the, the actual data village. We're more than happy to talk to you about how we've experienced it or let you fool around with the product a little bit. Uh, if you have some time and you're still awake, please fill out the survey. So that sort of information is always really valid to us. Remember, this is a data conference, so you better believe we're gonna be analyzing it. And I'm really hoping Kai doesn't say to improve attendance and survey scores, get rid of Rob. If you're interested in connecting with me on LinkedIn, just hold up your phone, scan the image. You'll be able to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to talk at any point about data journeys. I love helping customers and companies move from where they are now and into where they can be as far as data goes. I'm a true data evangelist and I believe that data can solve some of the world's largest problems. We just have to figure out how to unlock what's inside of that. So I'll open the floor to any questions, but I wanted to make sure that everybody has plenty of time to get over to their next sessions. How does it know that? 
Yeah, yeah, how much the impact would end up being? It's basically just doing ROIs. So it says, hey, if I look at these, in this case, these customers, those that match this criteria have a higher likelihood of purchasing. But these guys don't. If we're able to shift them from this behavior to this behavior, then we'll move a certain percentage of them up to that behavior that we want them to be. And it would be 14.3% of them that would move up into that behavior we want them to have. It's never perfect. That's one of the things in the AI space that uh, we're still working on. Uh, at this point, those numeric values are best possible. Mathematically, what is the best that we can end up having? Realistically, we tend to see that our deployed actions to those get us about 50 to 60% of what the best possible values are. In the end, we're still just more interested in saying this one will get 14.3 and this one does seven, so it's twice as good. If we're only gonna get 50% of that, okay, but we still want the action that's twice as good as the other ones. Yeah. How does it, how do you, mm -hmm. So in that instance, what he's actually looking at is uh, he takes one file that has all the cards that is his friend. He has one file that does the cards of that all his cards. He has a third file that we just pulled from the internet that's all the existing cards. And then it simply the target that we're looking at is comparing likelihood of win versus likelihood of win when those two files are connected to each other. So his win rate is only a 43% and his friend has a 57%, it'll look at the other cards that are available and suggests if you put this card in or if you change to this one, that'll change your win percentages up to 51%. Yeah, and that's kind of where we connected into like dashboards. So it's a lot easier when we're doing it from a dashboard because then we have some pre-curated data that we can then ask those questions on. If we're just throwing it out and saying, here's all the data, answer a question, it's kind of like throwing somebody into a lake of, of data files and just being like, solve something or, swim, or, or sink. Yeah, so a little bit of curation is definitely required. Yeah, these are good. Uh, it's a vertically scaled system, so it's really just how much hardware do you want to throw at it. Uh, you could theoretically go up into the petabytes of data. You'd probably run yourself bankrupt in that regard. Uh, it does fairly well with, again, what I would put in that dashboard size data sets. So let's say anything that's in a 50 gig below size. Once you start getting into those bigger, bigger files, even Tableau starts to struggle with doing some of that. But we do a lot of aggregations to try to minimize the impact of it. Uh, so that does help. I know it's a vague answer. I wish I could tell you this exact number. It's just not how it works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the question was kind of how do we integrate it into workflow if you're just a customer of like the Tableau server, right? So you don't actually have the access to the data values on the Tableau server. Uh, Kai can actually be given the same permissions that are set up inside the Tableau server. So the data in your dashboards that you receive is still data that's coming through the server and then you're able to see the actual viz on the front end. Same thing would happen inside Kai. So it connects into the data through whatever governancy plans that you guys have set up and then you're able to run that data analysis, but the, you can't make any modifications to the original data. So it's more like you're viewing that data, same sort of way that you'd view the viz in Tableau Server. You can make the final assessments. The one thing you wouldn't be able to do is that last step where I mentioned we send it back as a brand new data source into Tableau Server. That would be one of the things you wouldn't be able to do because you don't have access to the actual data. So your end result, you get a, a strategy, but you would then have to probably go back to whoever runs your Tableau server and say, hey, can I either gain access to this or can you build me a dashboard around this, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the question was actually, uh, let me surmise it here, how many tables, or how does it know how many tables to actually create? And then is it intelligent enough to delete the excess, the bloat that's then created? Uh, the answer is yes. There's a lot that we could go into on that discussion. So the shortest portion is that the automatic feature engineering step is first looking at the relevancy of the data itself. So it looks at the raw data to figure out the relevancy. It then starts to create new data values based on those things that have some relevancies. It essentially goes into a loop. So it creates new data, runs that back through relevancies, creates new data again inside those, runs that back through relevancies. So it's constantly trimming uh, what data it's using, and in the end, it's hoping to increase the relevancy of each of those items. So the relevancies are going up, the data volumes are going down, uh, and then we try to meet somewhere in the middle. But that's a good question that we can go into a lot deeper on how the models are working and how it's making the decisions and such. Yes? Yeah, if you want to stick around afterwards, I'll happily talk to you one-to-one -on, -one on that. Not one of those things I should probably say on microphone. <laughs> yeah. You need, there was a question on minimum size. This is a really good topic. Uh, in AI, one of the things that's common is the fact that there's, there's a large volume of data. You need a good chunk of data in order to make insightful decisions or to have strong confidence in it. Uh, Kai has a requirement of 100 Ver, uh, instances of whatever the question is. That's its data limit. So you need a minimum of that. If you're trying to say, hey, how do I increase repeat rate, like I showed in the example, we need just 100 customers who have repeated. If I want to increase monthly sales, I'm gonna need 100 months of that value in order to see it. So that's kind of the limitation. It's just 100 of whatever the question is that you want to answer. All right, well, I appreciate the time. I'll be sticking around for a little bit longer if anybody wants to ask direct questions, more than happy to. Other than that, welcome to Tableau Conference. Enjoy, there's plenty to learn here. I encourage you to bump into somebody you've never met before and simply ask them, how are you using data? And see where the conversation takes you. Again, my name is Rob Ortiz with Kients. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to meeting all of you later. Whoa.